All right, everyone, you guys can have a seat. We're going to go ahead and get started with session three, our Q&A time. When we were uh, preparing for this event, we thought it would be beneficial to take time, sit down in a Q&A setting, and have you guys ask Mike your questions along the lines of what he spoke about or maybe something that was not addressed in the first two sessions uh, uh, in regards to Roman Catholicism, uh, biblical Christianity, and evangelism. And as uh, Pastor Ryan had said uh, a moment ago before our lunch break, I just wanted to reiterate, this is a time where we're really encouraging questions uh, from the audience um, and, and have it not just be uh, a time of dialogue between Mike and I, but a dialogue between you and Mike. So at any moment, if you guys have a question, feel free to raise your hand. We have Jesse in the back there who's going to be on a roaming mic, and uh, we'll bring the mic to you. And we just ask that you'd speak into the mic because we're recording all of this. We definitely want to capture it um, on, on our recording device and make sure that that question, and we're live streaming. So the people tuning in also want to hear your question. So um, any moment, raise your hand and, uh, and we'll get to you. Mike, I know that um, you had mentioned a little bit in the first session, a little bit in the uh, second session, uh, just bits and pieces of your testimony, your background in Roman Catholicism and you coming to know the Lord. I, I thought it might be beneficial if you just kind of told us the whole story of your personal testimony, how you came to know Christ, and uh, mm -hmm. how the rest has been history. Well, sure. I always love to give a testimony of God's amazing grace, but I was born into a very devout Roman Catholic family, three brothers and a sister, and my uncle was a priest, my aunt was a nun, and... We were in church every time the doors were open. And all the way through high school, uh, we lived all over the world. I was in four different high schools, starting in Boston, going to India and Burma, and then Louisiana. And so I got to experience a lot of Catholicism around the world. My uncle, the priest, spent 30 years in Burma, converting the Burmese to Catholicism. And just as a side note, 50 years later, I was 13 at the time, 50 years later, through the providence of God, the Master's Academy International asked me to go to Burma wow. to train 81 seminary students on how to reach Roman Catholics. So in a sense, 50 years later, I got to go and undo <laughs> what my uncle had done. And uh, while I wasn't teaching, the people brought me out to witness to priests. And uh, two of the priests, they brought me out to meet uh, were disciples of my uncle. And so when I told them I was Father Gendron's nephew, oh, they got so excited. What brings you to Burma? I said, oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so one of the priests said, you don't have no right to interpret the word of God on your own. You have to come back to the church. And another one was Kumbaya. Why should we talk about doctrine? Let's just love Jesus. So anyway, that was a side note, but... Um, after college, I went down to Cape Kennedy, Florida. Ross Perot recruited me to Dallas. I worked for him, and um, I was very instrumental in bringing the first Bible study to a Catholic church in Dallas. You know, the Catholic church emulates the, the, the uh, dominant culture in America. It's evangelicalism, and so they saw all their Catholics were going to evangelical Bible studies like Bible study fellowship and community Bible study. So they said, we need to start one of our own. Mm -hmm. So it's called the Little Rock Scripture Study. And I helped bring that to Dallas. And boy, I'd like to go back and erase all those tapes. Because you know, what can an unconverted person do with the Bible? Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, after that, I opened the Bible at the age of 35. And and that's when the Spirit of God and the Word of God brought me to conversion. But it wasn't overnight. It was a process because I had the crisis of faith. And I would, as I mentioned earlier, go to my uncle, the priest, and talk to other people. And the more I read, the more I couldn't resolve the two. And that's when the Lord granted me repentance and life-giving faith and literally turned my life upside down. I realized I was like a sponge and the dryness of the desert. I, all I wanted was the Word of God. So every Monday morning before I went to my work, I had a different Bible study to attend every morning and just taking it all in. And, and finally, I realized, you know, Dallas Seminary is right in my backyard. Why don't I go there and purge myself of all the Catholic indoctrination? And the last semester at seminary, 
we were introduced to a video called Catholicism Crisis of Faith by Jim McCarthy, and it interviewed former priests and nuns that were reaching back into the Catholic Church. And I said, can I borrow this? I got to share it with my wife who grew up Catholic. And as we watched it together, it was just so important that we share this with every Roman Catholic we knew. So we started inviting Catholics over every Tuesday night. For the next three months, we saw 17 Catholics exchange their religion for a relationship with Christ. And it wasn't all good news. There were some that stormed out of the house and slammed the door so hard that cracks were in the wall. But, you know, through it all, we recognized God was using us to share the gospel with Catholics. And what do you do with 17 new babes? You invite them back on Wednesday night to help them grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. And, and we, little did we know, but that was the genesis of the ministry that we're doing today, 32 years later. People started asking us, can you give us some tip sheets so we can witness to our family and loved ones? And that was the beginning of our newsletter and publishing gospel tracts. And, and God has literally taken us around the world on two different occasions, just New Zealand, Australia, and Italy, and all over Europe, and Central America, and Southeast Asia, and Canada, and Ireland, Northern Ireland. I mean, just wherever there's an overwhelming number of Catholics, we've been there to equip the body of Christ. And we literally stand in awe because we never set out to do any of this. It was just be, being obedient to the Lord, making ourselves available. And so it's, it's really been exciting. Um, one of the things that I can share with you is how many of you are familiar with American Gospel, the documentary that they did? Well, they came and they interviewed me for 10 hours on Roman Catholicism. Not all at one time, fortunately. It was three hours Friday night, four hours Saturday morning, and three hours Monday morning. But they're starting to release that now on American Gospel TV. So I think if you have an opportunity to subscribe to that if you're not already subscribing. It's only five bucks a month, but there's a lot of good conservative teachers on there, so it will be worth your, your time. So that brings us to um, just what a joy it's been to serve the Lord this way and to be available to him. You know, we pray for open doors of opportunity, and he's the one that opens doors and brings us to where we're going, and, and he's the great enabler. You know, I, I marvel that... Um, we're still able to do the work that he started 32 years ago through a couple of broken vessels. Mm -hmm. hey Amen. Yeah, the, the past two sessions, I know for, for a fact that sitting back there, I was blown away hearing your stories of bravery, courage, mm -hmm. boldness, walking in the confessionals, uh, uh, engaging evangelistically priests. Mm -hmm. um, a question I had, Mike, is what motivates you to be so bold in evangelizing the people that you evangelize? What, what fires you up? Well, my love for Christ compels me. I mean, I recognize that's why he left me here after he saved me, was to be an instrument to take his gospel throughout the world. And um, also my great love and compassion for Catholics who are where I was. I mean... Catholics today believe they're in the one true church. They're deceived. They don't know it because they haven't been confronted with the truth. And it's my great love and compassion for Catholics because the only hope they have is if people with the gospel know how to reach them. And so that's why it's been such a joy to equip the body of Christ all over the world. Uh, Masters Academy International has been so instrumental in um, giving me the opportunity to take it to all the countries dominated by Catholicism. So yeah, it's, it's love for our Lord and it's love for the lost because that's where we all were before we heard the gospel. And if we hadn't heard it, we'd still be lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mike, um, oh, did I see a hand back here? Oh, no, okay. Okay, Corey's got a question. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just no, please, please. Mike, thank you so much for everything. This, uh, this is very, very helpful, and I don't think anybody can walk away without uh, being confused that Roman Catholicism and biblical Christianity are two opposing mm -hmm. um, systems of belief. So that's pretty obvious. My question to you is, and I am curious about your position on what should we as evangelicals, what should we as non-Catholic uh, biblical Christians, what is your position on 
uniting with them, not ecumenically over issues of theology, yeah. but say political issues were if, if there's lobbying for against abortion and there's a Roman Catholic crowd, how do you feel about evangelicals joining on that front where well, we're not talking about, you know, faith and theology? Well, of course, these are obviously related to that, but we're not talking about direct theological positions. We're talking about uniting on policy change. Sure. Corey, that's a good question. If these unity accords had left out theology, I would have signed them because we ought to be co-belligerents with Catholics, but not when it compromises the gospel. And a couple of things I can say on that. When you look at church history, you look at the Old Testament, God didn't need a mass number of people to accomplish his purpose. He needed some faithful people sold out to the Lord. And that's all he needs is a few people. So why are evangelicals uniting with Catholics over these issues when it compromises the gospel? 2 Corinthians six fourteen to 18, Paul exhorts us never to be unequally yoked. What does Christ have in common with Belial? What does light have in common with with darkness? What does an unbeliever have in common with a believer? So we need to remain sanctified by the truth. I definitely believe in fighting the social wars. We go out to abortion clinics constantly, but we're there for two reasons, to save life and to preserve life and also to spread life. But you know, Catholics are outnumbering us at these abortion clinics. They go out there with their statues of Mary and their pictures of Mary and they're praying the rosary. They need to be evangelized. So we're there to share the gospel with them, but also to turn mothers away from destroying their babies. And so it's up to the Lord on how successful we are in both ends, but we've seen success and we'll continue to do that, but we'll never compromise the gospel. And I, I hope all of you realize that, that God does, want, does not want us uniting with unbelievers to accomplish his purpose. He can do it with faithful evangelicals sold out to Christ that are unwilling to compromise. So, if I understand you right, with, I'm trying to think how this would play out. So is it, would you agree with joining with Roman Catholics, say, on a uh, protesting abortion? At a, I'm thinking of an abortion clinic right by my seminary. Where, yeah, where we I do work. all the time. But and, again, not to compromise the gospel, but to proclaim right. it. To the so, then you have, there. so then you have actual Catholics here you can evangelize. So you're there. Sure. Dual United purpose. on this front, a dual purpose, right? Yeah. Okay, that's what uh, that's that's a that's to a, save the physical life and then to proclaim the opportunity for spiritual life. That's an excellent strategy to be sure. there for the help that can be given across these traditions to be able to say uh, lobby against an evil genocide like abortion, as well as evangelize those that are of, sure. of or that are in that crowd that aren't of the same faith as uh, holding up the gospel. So that's very helpful. Thank you. We were protesting in an abortion clinic in Portland. And I had a John 14, 6 sign, and I was standing there in front of it. Uh, I had stepped off into the street, and here comes, um, was it a Jeep? SUV. SUV, just barreling right for me. And so I saw it at the last moment. I stepped out of the way and got back on the curb, and um, the Jeep or the SUV fled away. But the people were filming it. And so they got the license number. Within 10 minutes, the cops had arrested him. And so they asked me if I'd like to press charges. And I said, do I have to come back to Portland? <laughs> they said, yes. And I said, well, drop the charges. Then. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. Mm -hmm. Mike, um, an event like this, uh, the Bible says, is no spiritual pep rally, but it is God who gifts evangelists for the purpose of equipping the church to do the work of the ministry, mm -hmm. as it's said in Ephesians chapter 4. Um, you really helped us um, last session help uh, practicing, professing Roman Catholics overcome some obstacles mm -hmm. that stand in the way um, between them and, and repenting, on the level that we can, yeah. and, and helping them understand the false doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church and the biblical doctrine in the Word of God, but um, I think everyone here is under the understanding that there are hurdles that we face as evangelists mm -hmm. that precede doing that. And I was just wondering if you, you mentioned one of them, um, more of a head hurdle, which would be not knowing mm -hmm. really much about Roman Catholicism or not even knowing biblical doctrine well enough to engage um, a Roman Catholic in the truth. But 
Um, perhaps you can just comment on how um, the believers here can really overcome other head hurdles uh, and heart hurdles, such as uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not gifted. I'm no, I'm no Mike Gendron. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just I can't do what he does. Or the heart issues, the fear of man, fear of rejection. You know, how, how should we think about those common obstacles? And what would you provide as solutions to overcoming them in evangelistic efforts? Well, um, bottom line is that's why I wrote the book, Preparing for Eternity. And I wrote it with a dual purpose. I wrote it as a book that you can give to a Roman Catholic. It's written in the spirit of love and compassion. But I also wrote it to equip the body of Christ to know how to witness to Catholics. And so I present the book pretty much the same way the Lord saved me, point, counterpoint. This is the truth of God's word. This is what opposes it in the Catholic Church. And so as a Catholic reads it, it forces them to make a decision. And so as you read the book as a Christian, you'll know all the scriptures that are powerful to um, penetrate a stubborn heart. And um, as you probably know by now from my PowerPoint keynote, I love contrast. I love point counterpoint. So the middle section of the book, Preparing for Eternity, I deal with those contrasts because we need to teach antithetically. We need to not only show people what the truth is, but if you're holding to something that opposes the truth, you need to repent of that and put all your trust and faith in Christ and his word. And so as far as, um, you know, people that may not feel equipped, uh, one of the other things that I think it was the, the Spirit of God that inspired me to do, uh, we put together a set of gospel cards. And uh, this has also got a dual purpose. I, I put together what I believe are the 12 most important words of the gospel. And it starts with God who created man perfectly, but man fell into sin. Now he needs Jesus Christ, his work on the cross, his resurrection and salvation can only come by grace through faith and repentance. And you receive the righteousness of God by believing the truth. So the back of each card, you've got four bullet points defining and explaining what each word means. So when I teach evangelism, you're probably can relate to this as far as when you teach. I ask people, what's keeping you from being a more faithful witness for Christ? The most frequent response, I don't feel like I know the gospel well enough. So I put this resource together so that we can go deeper into the gospel. We brought these to the State Fair of Texas as people walked by our booth. We had all the cards laid out. We said, which one of these would you like to know more about? And the one they picked up most frequently was sin. You know, it's almost like they, they knew they were sinners. They were looking for a loophole. They read the back of the card and put it down. What other card would you like to know more about? And so it lets them control the conversation. And you can ask them, is this what you understood the word to, to be? Jane and I love to cook and have uh, fellowship dinners. We have a huge um, circular table that seats 10 and great for conversation. Everybody's involved. But after dinner, we'll pass these cards out and we'll tell people, don't look at the back of the card, but when it's your turn, tell us everything you know about the card. And then the rest of the table gets to join in. And only then can they turn it over and read what they left out. So people have left our house saying, hey, the, the gourmet meal was great, but the conversation was so much better. Mm -hmm. So it's just different ways that we can share the gospel. But one of the things to remember is our job is sharing the gospel is that of a mailman. He's responsible for giving the mail to everybody in his route. He's not responsible for what they do with the mail. His job is complete. He's successful when he's delivered the mail. So it is with us. We're successful when we deliver the gospel. We can be successful every time we do it. We don't have to fear failure because God is the one that gives the increase. You'll never see conversions unless the word of God is accompanied by the spirit of God. So that should encourage you that you can be successful every time you evangelize. Amen. Um, we have a question. Uh, Mike, I, uh, I have a question about uh, Padre, I say it wrong. Pio. Pio. Uh, the reason, there's, recently there's two movies that are in mainstream 
Father Stu that Mark Wahlberg just did and Padre Pio that Shiloh LaBeouf just did. It seems that right now that our culture is trying to paint priests and Roman Catholicism in a positive light. Mm -hmm. Uh, But last night at dinner, you had shared with Allison and I that you knew Padre Pio. So I would, why it would be interesting to hear maybe the backstory, uh, your perspective of him versus what the movies are trying to say about him. Yeah, as I shared last night, when I met him as a 11, 12 year old altar boy, it really increased my faith as a Catholic because I thought, wow, here's a priest that has the wounds of Christ. This is true validation that the Catholic Church is the one true church. So I just felt like I was really blessed to have met him. But later on, after the Lord saved me, I picked up his autobiography, and he said that he would sit by his window, and souls from purgatory would stop by on their way to heaven, thanking him for suffering on their behalf to get them out of purgatory. And I thought, wow, what a fraud. What a fraud. And for Catholics to look to him as a saint now, calling him holy. And um, so it's it's interesting what the movie is going to depict. But um, you're right. The Catholic Church is pushing this ecumenical agenda. And they're really trying to draw all of us in. And I mentioned the Eucharist is one of the ways and the one true church, the church fathers. And now they're using Hollywood and, and movies to do that as well. So more than ever, we need to contend earnestly for the purity and the exclusivity of the gospel because one of the other problems, um, and I'm so, again, thankful for this church because I can't tell you how many times in 32 years we've had pastors call us and say, we need your help. One of our elders just joined the Catholic Church. And I would always say, no matter what the phone call is, did you ever warn them that Roman Catholicism is a false brand of Christianity? with a false gospel and a false Christ. No, I never did. We get calls from parents. My son or daughter is now engaged to a Roman Catholic. Our question is, did you ever warn them? And so that's one of the things I'm hoping to accomplish tomorrow with the church on Sunday morning is to to warn parents that if you have children that will soon be dating and courting, warn them that we cannot be unequally yoked. We cannot date or evangelistically date Catholics. We need to evangelize them, but not get into a dating relationship. So I don't know if that answered the question, Ryan, but yeah, they're, they're on the move. I mean, we know the fulfillment of prophecy is right before us. There will be a global religion and it will be led by a false prophet. I think if we're in the season of the Lord's return, the office of the papacy has to be the Pope. Maybe not this one, even though he's very ecumenical. By the way, he's promoting a lot of bishops to cardinals right now with the same Marxist theology that he has. And so he's prepping the Catholic Church to be very ecumenical and um, drawing all Christians together. So we have to be contending for the faith. We have a question right here. Pastor Star first and then Pastor Dave. You talked to uh, someone who was raised as a Roman Catholic, has left the church and says they're a Christian, goes to Christian church, but gets upset when a pastor says that Roman Catholicism is false teaching. And then they can tell you that, well, they, they came to the Lord when they were young, I know, known Jesus and followed him, but you know they didn't. How do you, how do you counter that? Remember that the great way to respond to anyone is to ask a question. So why do you get upset? Don't you know it's false? I mean, you came out of it. Why did you come out? Is it because it was false? And do you really think you trusted the Jesus that's gloriously revealed in Scripture when you were young? Or were you trusting the Eucharistic Christ that continued the work of redemption on the altar? And so just by asking questions, um, sometimes I'm asked, are there any born-again Christians in the Catholic Church? Yes, but they're no longer Catholic. 
you cannot be a Catholic Christian. That is an oxymoron. And so what you, if a born again Christians in the Catholic Church, they're no longer Catholic and they need to come out. Uh, the Holy Spirit will eventually move them out as they're being discipled. That's why the Great Commission, go and make disciples, teaching them to observe everything Christ has commanded. You cannot remain in a church that commits the most serious sin of idolatry by worshiping the Eucharist. It's no different from the Israelites worshiping the golden calf as the true God that delivered them out of Egypt. God put 3,000 to death because he hates idolatry. So a born-again Christian cannot stay, but we need to disciple them, teach them to observe. And by the way, John 4, 24, God seeks worshipers in spirit and in truth, and you can't remain in the Catholic Church and worship God the way he wants to be worshiped. But mm -hmm. this person that I'm talking about hasn't been in the Catholic Church for over 20 years. She goes to a church. She's studies the word, she knows the word, but she just gets really offended when pastors talk about Catholicism as being false um, teaching. And I, and I couldn't I'd ask her, but I didn't get any kind of an answer. And she just... Well, prover. She, yeah. You know, oftentimes if people don't want to answer a question, they'll deflect it, they'll ignore it, or they'll go on to another subject. You have to be ready for that when you witness to Catholics. If they don't have an answer, they're, they're going to deflect it. If you pretty much box them into a corner with the scripture, they're going to escape by changing the subject. And so you don't let them do that. Keep going back to the point that you made. Are you going to submit to the authority of God's word or are you going to deflect it and ignore it now? Don't let them go on to another topic until you settle the one you've talked about. She actually teaches a Bible study yeah. using well, and, and make, make sure she knows that God wants us to love the truth and hate what is false. So you cannot love the Catholic Church after you recognize it's a false religion. Yeah. Even just walking her through the notes from session one and just mm -hmm. giving the clear biblical distinction. So, let, so bring it to her then. Bring it tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Dave. So, uh, Mike, um, I fully accept that God brings people to re repentance, and it's his sovereign will to save those that he will save. Um, and I guess my question is maybe more tactical. Uh, and how to approach a situation. My mom is 90 years old. Um, I think I told you I was raised Catholic. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, my family was, were devout Catholics until I left the Catholic Church, and then it all blew up for them. Um, but recently I was sharing the gospel with my mom and um, trying to use Scripture. I said, she doesn't believe that well, I, like you said, they're, they're very slippery. When you pin them one place, they jump someplace mm -hmm. else. Well, I'm not a sinner. I said, well, Mom, let's go through the Ten Commandments. Um, have you ever lied? Have you ever told an untruth? Have you ever um, hated someone? And Yes, yes, yes. Well, then, then it, she diverts to, well, um, my, the good things I do outweigh the bad. And... Um, I know this is a work of God, but tactically, is there any way to, or experiences you've had to push past them um, just diverting to something else? Other than, because I'm persistent and I stay sure. after, after it, but it's like trying to nail jello to the wall sometimes. Yeah, well, in Romans one seventeen. Paul says the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. And so, you know, Martin Luther, if you, if you know his story, he would go to confession two or three times a day. He was very aware of his sin. And he used to hate the righteousness of God until he recognized the great exchange and 
2 Corinthians 5.21, but I would encourage your mom that God's righteousness requires perfection. Mm -hmm. And whatever God demands, God provides. God demands perfect righteousness. He provides it in his son. He gives the gift of righteousness to all those who put their trust in him. And that is your only passport into heaven. You must put on the robes of Christ's righteousness by faith in order to get into heaven. Yeah, we would so, you know, I think the three most common omissions of the gospel all begin with an R. Repentance, often left out. The righteousness of God, often left out. The resurrection of Christ, often left out. And Paul said, without the resurrection, our faith is futile. So we, make, we need to make sure we mention all three of those in a gospel presentation because that eliminates anybody that thinks they're good enough. And by the way, when you ask people, how do you hope to get to heaven? Four out of five times, it's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Four out of five times, they will not mention Jesus. And I'll ask them after they go on for five minutes, what about Jesus? You never mentioned Jesus, the Savior. Oh, well, of course you have to believe in Jesus. Well, why didn't you mention the name above all names? It's just so heartbreaking. Yeah. I mean, Corey, thanks for your book. The country is biblically illiterate. They don't know the gospel. They don't know how to communicate it. So praise God for this church. Thank you. Another question from Don. Um, two questions unrelated, but the first one is, what's the significance of the rosary and the Hail Marys to the Catholic? And the second one prompted me, was prompted by your comment about the Pope, the present Pope. How does he reconcile his Marxist views with a belief in God? Oh, how does he justify his belief with the word of God? You know, he believes atheists will go to heaven as long as they're sincere. He believes homosexuals will go to heaven. You know, he was featured on the front cover of the gay magazine because he proclaims that homosexuals will make it into heaven. So how does he reconcile that with the Bible? How does he recognize, reconcile anything? So uh, this pope is the most bizarre pope we've had in many, many years, but he's pushing forward the ecumenical movement like never before. John Paul started it, Benedict pushed it for a while, and now this guy is just taking it to the, the nth degree. But as far as the rosary, um, you know, Catholics need to look at Matthew 6, where Jesus taught us how to pray. Don't use repetitious words like the pagans. And um, that's what the rosary is. It's 53 prayers to Mary. And those that grew up Catholic, we can still recite the Hail Mary, can't we? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. So Catholics... Believe this is an indulgence. If you go to a Catholic wake, you will see the people gathered around the casket praying the rosary. That's an indulgence to help the dead person get out of purgatory. So it goes against scripture. Christ taught us how to pray and what not to pray. Becky? Thank you. Sorry you had to walk up to the front. Um, my question is, I was under the assumption that Mary was a reverent figure in the Catholic Church. I didn't realize that she was holy status. Do they believe that Mary forgives sins and is a, as, as is Christ to them? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how that fits. Yeah, well, Catholics will say they don't worship Mary. They venerate her. But if you look up venerate in the dictionary, it says to worship. So it's just a play on words. And uh, they do worship her and they elevate her to really the attributes. She's got so many of the attributes of God. And so they don't say she's the fourth person of the Trinity. But when you look at the attributes, Jesus is king of heaven. She's queen of heaven. Jesus is the advocate. So Mary's the advocate. Jesus is the redeemer. Mary's the co-redeemer. Um, Jesus was sinless, Mary is sinless. Jesus is the mediator, Mary is the co-mediator. Um, Jesus hears and answers our prayers, Mary 
hears and answers our prayers. So she has to be omniscient to, to do that. So she's given the attributes of God. And uh, I think you were here when you saw the, the paragraph numbers uh, in the catechism that say she is the cause of salvation. And I'll never forget my uncle on two occasions um, when I asked him, why do people pray to Mary? And he said, well, just think about it. If you wanted, um, if, let's see, Mary has so much influence on her son. So if you pray to her, she will have Jesus answer your prayers because she has influence over him. And, you know, when it comes to the perpetual virginity of Mary, I asked my uncle about that. And boy, the, the way he responded, you know, that Mary, I told him Mary had other children four brothers, and we don't know how many daughters, and his response was, Mary would never stoop that low to have sex. Yeah, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, her perpetual virginity. It's a very bizarre religion. You, you just got kind of the surface of it in the first hour this morning. Why did they adopt that? What was their... Why did Satan divert the attention away from Christ. Yeah, I mean, that's the, whole, that's the whole strategy of Satan is to divert people's attention away from Christ alone. There are more churches named after Mary than they're named after God. Oh, you know, we've been listening to Catholic radio just to hear what's the latest. I mean, now she's the mother of ransom. Yeah, that, I heard that this morning. She's got so many different titles She's got more titles than Christ. So anyway, the, the focus, get away from Christ and focus on something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, oh, so how do you evangelize? My mother, Mary, is above. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to evangelize her. But Mary, I can say nothing. I can talk about Jesus. But when it comes to Mary, there's, I mean, she's got her idols and Mary's number one. So how do you evangelize to her in Spanish, which mm -hmm. is even a little difficult because she sees that I'm in a cult. And do you speak Spanish? Yes. Okay. And so it, I don't know how to dig into showing well, her the truth. Well, this is a good question because we have to emulate the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. I want to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. You must stay focused on the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Your mother will not be willing to let go of her devotion to Mary until she knows that Christ is the only mediator, the only savior, and he is sufficient to save her completely and forever. Stay focused on him. Because uh, their, their goal is to take you on rabbit trails. Keep coming back to Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. Diego? Um, I had a question regarding the Bible. Um, can we use their Bible to show them? Definitely. Yeah. Good question. Um, and is the Apocrypha a hurdle that we'll have to face? or, or Most Catholics don't even know the Apocrypha is in their Bible. Most Catholics haven't even opened their Bible. So, uh, yes, by the, the first question, if you have a Catholic with their own Bible, I encourage you to use their Bible because they are told not to trust anything from the Protestant church. So open their Bible, take them down the Roman road, answer all of their questions with their Bible, give them confidence in their Bible, and then encourage them to keep abiding in God's word. Then you'll know the truth that will set you free from any religious deception that you're in. You're going to have to turn the pages for them because they won't know where to, where to turn. Mm-hmm. We have a question from Pastor Ryan. Oh, is their Bible the same? They have the same 66 books that we do. However, during the um, Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church had to try and justify indulgences and purgatory because, you know, that was one of the sparks of the Reformation. And so they recognized in Second Maccabees that during the Maccabean Revolt, Judas Maccabees walked around and saw pagan amulets around their dead soldiers. So it says in 2 Maccabees, they sent alms back 
to Jerusalem for the repose of their souls. So the Catholics grabbed onto that and said, see, there is an intermediate place and we can offer indulgences to get people out. So how is our response to that? Well, number one, the Apocrypha is not the inspired word of God. Um, number two, we don't do things just because the Jews did things. After all, the Jews rejected their Messiah. So they committed a lot of um, deceptive practices, including sending alms back and praying for the dead. But that's the reason they added the Apocrypha. We have a question from Pastor Ryan. Uh, I have a question and a comment. My question is, Mike, do you think that the majority of Roman Catholics uh, out there do not understand what Rome believes? Do not understand? W Roman Catholic dogma? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a whole spectrum of... Um, there's a whole spectrum of Catholics that goes from the twice, thank you, the twice a year Catholics that go on Resurrection Sunday and Christmas, all the way to Catholic apologists and followers of them, and so they're very sharp on Catholic doctrine. And so um, it depends. I mean, that's why you have to ask a lot of questions when you witness to Catholics to find where they are on this continuum, because they're all over the place. And most of the time you're gonna meet Catholics that know very little about their faith. <coughs> In fact, I can tell you that many of them check their brain at the door. They go through the motions. They put in their prison sentence because they have to be there on Sunday under the penalty of mortal sin. Some of them come late and leave right after the Eucharistic sacrifice because they're allowed to leave after that. And so, yeah, there's all kinds, and you just have to know who you're talking to. And the second one? The uh, second one's more just a comment, I think, to some of our folks that are asking about witnessing to their Roman Catholic family and friends. Uh, last night, I got if you get to hang out with Mike uh, pretty much anywhere, him and his wife Jane, they're going to see them try to evangelize someone. And our server was a Roman Catholic, and Mike began to engage him. And it was interesting to watch uh, him uh, try to skirt the questions that Mike was answering him. I think the difference is some are asking him. I think uh, what... What Mike was doing, though, is he would not let the guy out from underneath the question. And at that point, there was going to be one of two responses. He was either going to entertain the thought, or he was going to reject Mike. And what happened last night is he rejected Mike. And so I think part of being an evangelist, as Mike said, is remembering God. the results are in God's hands, but it's our job. Paul says in Titus, let no one disregard you. Mm-hmm. And so you keep them as they try to squirt a thousand. You just keep bringing them back, bringing them back. What Mike did last night is he said, are you a Christian? And the guy said, ah, I'm a Catholic, and I'm going to be a Catholic until I die. And Mike said, well, what's your authority? And he just started squirming. Uh, you know, on what basis do you believe those things? I, I feel like it's right. So Mike said, oh, so you think that your feelings are an authority, not the word of God. And Mike kept ramping up because he was going, he was trying to pin this guy down on what is his authority, but he got very, he didn't want to come back to our table. Mike wasn't mean, he wasn't rude, uh, he wasn't crass, it, but it made this young man uncomfortable. I think sometimes when we evangelize our family, we have to prepare ourselves that when we go down this road, uh, they're going to feel very uncomfortable. Um, and we need to keep pressing the issue because what's at stake is their soul, um, their eternal destiny. So that's just a comment. And yeah, my experience and Ryan, of watching Mike last night. It's good to remind everyone Jesus was the most perfect evangelist the world has ever known. How many times was he rejected? A lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, Jennifer had a question. <clears throat> While you're coming up front... Uh, Trevor asked me a question before he left. He had to leave, but he said, Mike, what do you deal, how do you deal with Roman Catholics who say that uh, following traditions is in the scriptures? And there's three places in the New Testament that are spoken positively about tradition. So we need to know how to answer Catholics who point to those scriptures. The first one is uh, 1 Corinthians 11, Two. Now I praise you because 
you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So in all three of these cases, this verb tense is always past tense. In this case, they've already been delivered. And the source of the tradition was an apostle, the apostle Paul. So another one is in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. Verb tense is past. The source of the tradition is an apostle. So we hold to the apostolic traditions that are found in the word of God. We can also point to Jude 3. We are to earnestly contend for the faith that was un once and for all delivered, past tense, to the saints. So the body of truth, tradition, and scripture that we are to hold to was signed, sealed, and delivered in the first century church. You saw all the traditions that the Catholic Church has added since the first century. That is what we're to contend against. Those are ungodly traditions. Those are traditions of men. They're not the apostolic traditions. Go ahead, Jennifer. I have two questions, actually, after hearing you. Um, maybe I'll just do this one first. So um, I was listening to a Catholic apologist, too, because I want to know where they come from. Um, and in Romans 3, the passage that goes through, you know, there's no non, none righteous, no not one, no one seeks after God. He paused and he's like, I'm seeking after God, obviously. That's not true. So how do you respond to that? Yeah, let me answer that. Everyone is seeking after their God, the God of their own imagination, the God of their religious tradition, but no one seeks after the true God, and that's the difference. What if he were to say, though, but I am? Well, you can show them by the authority of Scripture that Jesus Christ is not the Jesus of the Catholic Church. Let me quickly share the scriptures that you can share that prove that the Jesus of the Catholic Church is a false Christ. It says in Hebrews 9.28, Jesus will return a second time and not in relation to sin. The Catholic Jesus returns every day and it is to be offered again as a sin offering. So Hebrews 9.28 destroys the Eucharist. The Bible also says in Acts 3 that he will return to the same place he left, to the Mount of Olives. The Bible also says Jesus will return the same way he left. He left in a body. The Bible also says that Jesus will return after the tribulation, not every day. And so from Scripture, you can show that the Jesus of the Eucharist is a false Christ, and those who follow that and worship that are committing idolatry. So would you point them then the, the course of the conversation? So what, who is the God that you seek mm -hmm. and get down to the heart of who they actually are seeking? Sure. Yeah, describe the Jesus that you worship. Yeah, let them dig their own grave, if you will. Okay. Mm -hmm. My second question is, we've talked about um, people who don't really know what they believe. What about the person who's very well-versed in every aspect, have, has everything memorized, a priest, for instance, right? Is there, wanting to address the intellectual, I know we're bringing it back to scripture, back to the gospel of Eve, that's where you're going to bring me to this conversation, but is there um, like church history book that you could offer just for further reading and study? Hmm. Yeah, Nathan Busnitz, who's a professor at the Master's Seminary, is a specialist in church history, and he's written a couple of good books. Nathan Busnitz, B-U-S-I-N-E-T-Z. Mm -hmm. Church history? Or? Mm -hmm. Church history. Mm -hmm. And we really need to know our church history. Um, one of my messages, I don't know if we still have it, I've got a DVD out there that looks at the Roman Catholic church in its past and also what's possibly its future. And I show how the Roman Catholic Church drifted into apostasy just step by step, century by century. 
By the way, the first step into apostasy was when they did away with the plurality of elders and they elevated a bishop. See, it's a lot easier for Satan to attack one person than an elder board that's holding one another accountable. So that was their first step into apostasy by eliminating the plurality of elders. And then each church had a reigning bishop and the Catholic Church said, well, we need to have a bishop over all of the churches. And so in 596, they named Pope Benedict, Pope Gregory I as the first pope in 596. The fact that they say Peter was the first pope, he was a fellow elder. He wasn't a pope. And uh, they didn't have a reigning pope until the sixth century. So this is all good to know as you study church history. Mike, um, how should a converted Catholic, so someone who was formerly Roman Catholic but has been converted to Christ, um, how should they now look at baptism? Should they be rebaptized if they mm. were baptized in the Catholic Church? Definitely. Because after all, baptism is for believers. You need a scripture verse, Acts 10, 47. Peter asked the question, what's to keep these people from being baptized? They have already received the Holy Spirit. The only way to receive the Holy Spirit is to be born of God. So you're a new creature in Christ. Then you go through water baptism. And water baptism is a profession of faith. It shows that you're dying to self as you go under the water and you're being raised as a new life in Christ Jesus as you come out of the water. So um, the Catholic Church teaches that baptism is the sacrament of regeneration and the sacrament of justification. So those are both lies of the devil. You have to have faith. We have a question yeah. in the back. Levi? Oh, Levi. Mm -hmm. um, my papa believes he's a Roman Catholic and... My dad's been trying to take him out of that, and I want to see how I can help doing that, but my dad always says, be respectful to those who are older than you. <laughs> yes. Well, your dad is teaching you the truth, that's for sure. Yes, we have to respect our elders, but I think the greatest way to respect them is to show how much you love them and we don't want to let our family members remain dead in their sins. We have to show them the only way they can come alive in Christ, and that is by believing Christ alone as their Savior. And when we say Christ alone, that means they have to quit trusting in anything they're doing to save themselves. They have to put all of their faith, all of their hope, all of their confidence in Christ he is the only Savior. So that's what I would stay focused on. Grandpa, let go of everything you're doing and come to the cross with empty hands of faith. Okay? Amen. Pastor Ryan? Mike, I'd love to get your pastoral opinion on uh, whether or not you believe that Christians should or should not participate in Roman Catholic events like baptism. So if a family member says, hey, mm. little Johnny's getting baptized. Yeah. Boy, um, we get that question all the time. And number one, we have to encourage people to make sure they're honoring God above everything else. Yes, you love your family, but you love God more. And as I shared earlier, Jesus came to divide father against son, mother against daughter. So there are certain, port, certain events in our life that we have to make this decision. I would say that each, each one of these events, whether it be baptism, matrimony, or a funeral, they're all life events. And so we have to weigh the consequences of what we do. Ultimately, it's to love God above all things and use every one of them as a teaching moment, especially baptism. You know, we can open the scriptures and show them that baptism is only for believers. We can show them that your church teaches that infant baptism is a sacrament of regeneration. We can take them to John 3 and show them this is the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. It's not through the efficacious waters of baptism. 
We can show them that their catechism teaches this is the sacrament of justification. We can show them all the way through the New Testament where justification is by faith. How does this seven-day-old infant have the capacity to believe anything? So use that as a teaching moment. Um, I think weddings are a little bit different. Um, some weddings, they offer the sacrifice of the mass as part of the wedding ceremony, and we can definitely not participate in that. But I think through prayer and seeing how difficult it is with the family, go to the wedding reception afterwards. Um, funerals are another teaching moment. Wow. Talk about a great time to pass out gospel tracts because everybody realizes one day they're going to be in that casket and one day they're going to be meeting their creator. And the only way he'll be a merciful savior is if they repent and believe the gospel while they still have a chance. So yes, um, Use them for teaching moments. And I don't think everything is a black and white situation. Definitely baptism is not something you want to go to. The mass is not something you want to participate in. But I think uh, wedding receptions, no problem. Even, even after the baptism, if you wanted to go join the family after that but not participate in the event, that may be a way to, to show them that you love the family but you can't participate in the actual event. Yes. Uh, we have a question up here, Jesse. I'm just, I'm just tagging on to that one. What if the wedding is your child? Wow, um, that, that's a difficult one, and, and we get that question asked a lot. Um, I think early on, parents will say that I cannot support you marrying a Catholic. And hopefully that would put enough pressure on them to reconsider. Um, what's really sad is that the question we get is often from parents that brought their children up in the Christian faith. But again, they never warn them about dating Catholics or not protecting their heart. And so they end up being engaged. And by then it's too late because they've already given their heart away. Yeah, that's just something that uh, each, each parent has to prayerfully consider because the last thing you want to do is um, break off a relationship with your son or daughter. More than likely, if they're marrying a Catholic, they're a false convert. Because how can anyone go directly against God's word? Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. That's just black and white in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. So any Christian that marries a Catholic is deliberately disobeying God. So probably a false convert. Mike, I know you already mentioned it um, in your first session, but could you just once more take us back through the differences between Christian ordinances or sacraments and uh, Catholic mm -hmm. sacraments? Yeah, the Lord established the church with two ordinances, the Lord's Supper, do this in memory of me, and um, the Catholic Church takes that as a sacrifice, the Lord's Supper. You know, Jesus... Um, at the Last Supper, said, take this bread and eat of it. This is my body, and the cup represents his blood. But yet Jesus was right there in front of them. Nobody was gnawing on his body. You know, a lot of Catholics don't realize that Jesus spoke in figurative language. John 16, 25, I have spoken to you in figurative language. Jesus claimed to be a door. And yes, the Catholic Church has a holy door at St. Peter's, and the Pope says if you go through it, you get a plenary indulgence. But Jesus used figurative language throughout his earthly ministry, and um, John 6 is something we all need to be prepared to answer. You know, if you have your Bibles, you can open it to John 6, and I can give you a, a quick couple of verses to share with Roman Catholics. John chapter 6. This is where the Catholic Church establishes the Eucharist as the physical body and blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. So what has just happened as we enter into John chapter 6? Jesus just fed the 5,000, right? And then he crosses the Sea of Galilee, and the multitudes follow him across the sea, and they're looking for another free lunch. 
But Jesus is not offering physical food now. He's offering spiritual nourishment. And so look at verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Then go down to verse 54. You will see that there's two other things people must do with the same result. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So if you behold and believe, you have eternal life, and you're guaranteed of the resurrection. Also, if you eat and drink, you have eternal life, and you'll be raised up on the last day. Well, what happens if someone beholds and believes but doesn't eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus? Do they have eternal life? Or what happens if someone eats and drinks but doesn't behold and believe? Do they have eternal life? So the only way these two verses can work together is if one is literal and the other is figurative. Jesus is literally saying, if you behold and believe in me, you will have eternal life and I promise to raise you up. And then he's speaking figuratively in verse 54. He is saying, I am the spiritual nourishment that you need for eternal life. Take me in. Um, the Old Testament says, eat the word of God. Is that literal or figurative? And so Jesus is talking about spiritual nourishment. Now, turn over. By the way, Jesus is speaking to a mixed crowd. It says in here, there was unbelievers that followed him. And so what happened when he said, you must eat my body and drink my blood? The unbelievers departed. They were unbelievers. They wanted physical food. Jesus was offering himself. So... When they left, Jesus said to the apostles, are you going to leave also? What was Peter's response? No, Lord, you have the flesh and blood of eternal life. No, you have the words of eternal life. And then Jesus says, the word I spoke to you were spirit. The flesh counts for nothing. So these are the verses you need to show Roman Catholics. He was talking figuratively, spiritual nourishment. He was talking about eternal life. Another thing you can ask Roman Catholics, why do you believe only part of verse 54? Why do you only believe, eat my body and drink my blood? You don't have eternal life. You only have conditional life. So why are you taking the first part literally and rejecting the second part? You can't have it both ways. If he's speaking literally, then why don't you believe you have eternal life? See, Catholics believe that they can commit a sin, of a mortal sin, and die in a state of mortal sin and go to hell. There's no assurance. There's no eternal life. They only have conditional life. So thanks for asking that question. This will come up a lot. I mean, the, the Eucharist is the focus of the Roman Catholic religion. We, we know Catholics that spend 20... We know Catholic churches that have perpetual adoration of the Eucharist. And so Catholics will sign up. I'll spend one hour with Jesus from six to seven in the morning. And then they'll have Catholics come in throughout the day to adore the Eucharist, to worship the Eucharist as if Jesus Christ was physically present. They put the Eucharist in a monstrance. It's like a sunburst. And Catholics will kneel down and spend time with their Jesus. So it's just heartbreaking. Mike, um, you obviously mentioned that your ministry, Proclaiming the Gospel, has a worldwide reach. Um, how can we, and, and obviously, you know, we've been exposed to a lot of your literature, but what are other ways we can support um, your guys' ministry? Oh, we need your prayers, so thank you for asking, yes. God is the great enabler, and uh, the reason we're still able to do this is because he empowers us and he enables us to continue to do the work. So yes, we really covet your prayers. Um, we get hit with fiery darts all day long, so we ask for prayers for our spiritual as well as physical protection. The devil hates what we're doing. We're exposing his greatest counterfeit, 
that is deceiving 1.3 billion people. He knows that only the truth will set them free. And so he's doing everything he can to keep the truth from Roman Catholics. So, yeah, we need, um, we need your prayers, and thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. Question here? That's okay. Jesse? Um, do you ever have, um, oh, what would you call it, not a mission trip, but maybe, where people can come just to be with you, and you go to different places, and they learn, and you talk, and that kind of thing? Yeah, we do. We Before COVID, we did that a lot, mm -hmm. especially down in Honduras. We've been to Honduras four different times, and it's really a neat opportunity. Pastors from all over Central America will come up to the TMAI um, school there in Honduras and um, I will train them all week and then we'll go out and evangelize and we've had people come down with us sometimes doctors will come down and dentists and um, you know they'll take care of them medically and then offer them spiritual nourishment as well so yeah um, stay posted if we get a chance to go overseas again or down to Central America it'd be nice for some people to join us Well, locally, we're always going out. Um, our church is very evangelistic. We go out um, every other Friday to South Lake Town Square, and that's an opportunity to evangelize people that are sitting on park benches waiting for their dinner reservations to be called, and great opportunity to witness to people because they're sitting there with nothing to do. Great opportunity to share the truth that will change their life. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, Jake, you take people out, don't you? So yeah, we have Jennifer, an get, get plugged here. in here. Mm -hmm. We canvass the neighborhoods locally here in San Juan and um, and other adjacent cities. Yeah, to San Juan. So door to door evangelizing and um, and other other means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike, I know that you, um, you and you've exhibited as Pastor Ryan was mentioning just. Um, uh, the occasion of meeting someone face to face for the first time and engaging in evangelistic conversation and some of the questions that you'd be asking. And you gave us a lot of helpful questions. I spoke to multiple people who were real thankful for that, just helpful tools to generate a conversation. In fact, some of the people I, I was talking to, that they were mentioning that that was really a, um, an obstacle for them. Is how, how, how do I even get, get the conversation started mm -hmm. with people I know, coworkers, yeah. neighbors, uh, family members? And in ongoing evangelistic relationships, what would you say in addition to striking up conversation through use of questions? How, what, what does that look like with, with those kind of ongoing instances and relationships? Um, would, you, would you have any further comment? Sure. Oh, there's just so many ways. Uh, look for what people are wearing, whether it be something on their shirt, maybe a cross, maybe a cap with something on there, and just ask a question that would lead into a spiritual conversation. When I see someone with a cross or a crucifix, if I see a cross, I'll say, I really like your cross. Where do you go to church? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that easy, and they'll say where, and, and I'll say, how does your church teach you? have any hope of going to heaven? And just right to the point, because most of the time you're going to meet people just for a few moments, and you can engage in a couple of questions and leave a gospel track. Jane likes to, uh, at the checkout counter, she asks a simple question, has anybody given you any good news today? And they always say no. And Jane will say, well, this is the greatest news you'll ever read. It's about the greatest gift you could ever receive. And just that quick, you can give the gospel in printed form. And, and Jane will say, read this on your break. So we can just sow the seed wherever we go and just rarely do I meet somebody that I don't engage them in a spiritual conversation. And, um, you know, when you go to different art fest and you walk around and you talk to people and there's just so many opportunities. I remember one of our Methodist churches had a booth at South Lake Town Square and I walked up to her and I said, how does Whitechapel Methodist Church teach anyone has any hope of going to heaven? And she said, well, that's easy. Just be as good a person as you can be. This is a church of 7,000 members. And she's out there with a booth encouraging people to come to the Methodist church. And so I had an opportunity to say, if that weren't true, according 
to the Bible, would you want to know the truth? And so I was able to share the gospel with her. And of course, I went back to our church and I said, we need to get a booth out there <laughs> next time there's an art fest. Yeah, so, you know, there's so many people spreading false gospels that we need to take every opportunity to share the true gospel. Just be observant. Just look at everybody as a, a candidate for the gospel. And it's so easy. I mean, if you've just completely drawn a blank, just ask them if they're a Christian. 86% of Americans say they are. But how many are born again? Very, very few. So. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Want to open up for any? Corey? Yeah, I have, I have a question. Uh, Mike, I, I noticed in... And the slides in the presentation, the differences between doctrine, <clears throat> between biblical Christianity or evangelicalism, to narrow it down a little more, and Roman, Roman Catholicism, one of the things I didn't see was anything about eschatology. And I'm wondering if, does that come up in your evangelism, say the eschatological position of Roman Catholicism would be amillennial, they're the kingdom of God on earth. And biblical Christianity, at least as we understand it here at Revolve, we're, we're pre-mill, the kingdom is still to come with Jesus when he returns. Does that ever come up in your evangelism? Is that an evangelistic conversation you ever have bringing up eschatology in those matters? Definitely, yeah. Um, I don't lead with that, but oftentimes it does come up. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to be stepping on any toes, but I'm just going to say it like it is. The reformers focused on soteriology. They wanted to get the gospel right they ignored eschatology. And so what happened is they brought Roman Catholic eschatology into their conversion experience. Roman Catholicism is amillennial, and so many of the reformers were amill. Many of the neo-reformed people today are amill because they only trace their eschatology back to the reformers. They don't go all the way back to Christ and the apostles. And so um, eschatology comes up a lot. Um, I really believe that the scripture shows that the rapture of the church will take place and then the tribulation period will take place. God will focus his attention on the Jews because it is the 70th week of Daniel. And um, Romans 11, it says, when the last Gentile comes in, then God will turn his attention to the Jews. So what would you like to be doing when the rapture occurs? I'd be, love to be witnessing to that last Gentile. Yeah. And then as the trumpet sounds, I can say, so you were the one. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so after the tribulation, the Lord will come back with all of the saints from the church and then he'll rule and reign for a thousand years from the throne of David. And what a joy that will be to serve him during the millennial. Amen. Levi? Um, when you said that in session two, um, when you said in session two that the Roman Catholics believe when they do have Christ and when they um, commit an immortal sin, they believe that they're out of Christ, but in the Bible, it says, once Christ has you, you cannot be taken away. So how, how do they believe in that, and how do they teach that in their Bible studies? Yes, Levi, that's a good question. And so often, the Catholics just ignore the Scripture. They elevate tradition to be equal, but then they have their bishops sitting above their scripture and tradition and they twist the scripture so it conforms to their tradition. So we know that Jesus is the good shepherd. He says once we are saved, he holds us in the palm of his hand, the palm of the Father's hand. No one can snatch us out. And um, we see that in First Peter that our inheritance is reserved in heaven, kept by the power of Almighty God. There's no greater power than Almighty God. So we have the assurance of eternal life based on the promise of our Savior and the power of God. But Roman Catholics just dismiss that and say, if you die in a mortal sin, then you go to hell. 
But we have to share with them that every sin is mortal, but the blood of Jesus Christ purifies us from all sin. And he canceled the eternal sin debt. In Colossians 2, 13 and 14, we see our eternal sin debt was nailed to the cross. So we no longer have to pay it. And we have that great promise in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So we, these are the scriptures we have to show. And then we have to say, are you willing to believe the inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of God? Or do you want to continue believing your ungodly traditions? Good question. Yes. Yes, I am. Um, at this point of life, a lot of us, or I am working from home, and so I'm no longer in the offices where I used to invite people to church or share the gospel. So now it's all phone, because a lot of companies have gone to work from home. I'm having a really hard time trying to, I pray for my coworkers, and I don't know them extremely well, their faith, but I want to share the gospel with them. And I've been praying for opportunities to do that, but... I haven't found, is there anything that you've seen change with people working from home and inviting people or sharing your faith? Yeah, I would invite them to get together with you for coffee or for lunch. Okay, we're doing that Tuesday. Good. <laughs> so now I'm praying that somehow, because none of them are believers, yeah. I can just tell, but they're, my boss is there. So, you know, I'm kind of like, oh, how do I... You know, only the Lord would lead that, but mm -hmm. I'm just praying for that. But I don't know if there's anything to, in the work environment, if there's anything that... Well, you have to honor your employer. You cannot yeah. witness on, on employee time. But yeah, lunch or coffee, great opportunity. I'd get a set of our gospel cards and, and just lay them out and say, which would you like to know more about? And then just have the conversation go that way. And I might do that because it's not a company sponsor. We're just going to get together. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I encourage you. Um, Jane and I had these dear friends. Uh, we love cooking with them and having them over, and they'd have us over. And, you know, they were our tennis friends. We saw them a lot. And we just decided we love them too much to not let another day go by without telling them the greatest news they would ever hear. So we invited him to dinner, and we said, we're going to share some stuff with you. And after dinner, we sat down and just laid out the gospel for an hour. He was an attorney that was uh, Roman Catholic. And um, after the presentation of the gospel was over, uh, they thanked us. They said, we could really sense that you really love us, and that's why you shared this with us. And they walked to the door, and they didn't respond to the gospel. They said that um, they appreciated us. But I told them as they were leaving, I said, you know, we're not trying to get you to leave anything, join anything, buy anything, sell anything. We just loved you so much. We didn't want another day to go by without sharing you this great news about eternal life with Christ. And to this day, they've never trusted Christ, but they still remain our dear friends. They ended up moving to Destin, Florida. They invite us down to spend time with them at their resort down there. And so I say all of this, if you let people know you're presenting the truth in love, how are they going to get angry with you? Yeah, we just need to let them know we love you. We want you to know the truth because there's nothing greater than to know where you'll spend eternity. And Mike, one last question I have is in that kind of relationship, I think we all know the answer, but you do you continue to go back to the gospel um, yeah. when you spend time with them? You know, that's a good question. I, I did a funeral of a former Roman Catholic nun that I had the great privilege of leading her to the Lord. I say leading her to the Lord. I gave her the scriptures where the Spirit led her to the Lord Jesus Christ. And after she became a Christian, she was diagnosed with cancer. So she asked me if I would baptize her. I did. And then she asked if I would do her funeral. She died seven months later. Wow. And as I was ministering to her in her hospice, she said, I want my Catholic family who will be at my funeral to know the truth. 
And so I said, well, why don't you write out your testimony and I'll let you speak from the grave. And so during the funeral, I read her testimony of how she renounced her Catholic religion, exchanged it for a relationship with Christ and how she wanted her family members to know. So I don't know if that answered your question, but um, there's great opportunities the Lord gives us and we just need to make the most of every opportunity and never let a divine appointment go by because then you'll regret it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. We have time for one last question if anyone has one. Diego. Um, so if you're sharing the gospel with someone, right, uh, a Catholic. Oh, um, can, I, yeah. can I just say something? Mm -hmm. The reason I brought that up is because the couple that we just talked about that we invited over, Jane told her that Mike just did a funeral. It was the most uplifting funeral that I've ever been to. And she said, I'd like to hear the message of the funeral. And so Jane got her a copy of the wow. funeral and, wow. and gave it to her. So yes, there was follow-up with that. Sorry, I forgot where I was going with the answer. Yes. Um, so I'm sharing the gospel with my uncle, who's he's Catholic. All of my mom's side are Catholic still. My dad's side are saved, most of them. Um, and as I was talking to him. Um, he kept deflecting as well. Um, I was just asking him questions um, to just kind of get him to think of what he was saying. But I'm going to go back, and I'm going to, God willing, finish this. But if the conversation ends up being where, like, I don't, I don't want you to talk about this no more, how do you deal with that? Do you... The next time you see them, do you bring it up or do you just don't touch the subject anymore? Or how do you go about that? Boy, that's such a good question. And I have personal experience. When I became a new creature in Christ, I could not wait to go home and tell my three brothers and sister and my parents the good news. I thought they would rejoice the same way I did. I backed up the theological dump truck and I let him have it all in one fell swoop. I didn't have a course on evangelism. I was just letting them have it in love. But uh, boy, you could just see they were reeling backwards and the, the walls started going up. And, but I continued to, um, to witness to them and they said, Mike, we're, we're excited for you that you found a new religion, but we don't want to hear any more about it. I said, but I don't have a new religion. I exchanged it for a relationship with Christ. Whatever, we don't want to hear anymore. And so what do you do? You honor that request. But what I did after that is I prayed to our sovereign Lord that he would send someone else to my family so that they could be a witness for Christ. So yeah, you have to honor the request. But hopefully you won't get to the point where I, I, I abuse them. I look back and I just, I wish that I waited on the Holy Spirit. I wish that I just sowed a few seeds and paused. I wish that I had a balanced conversation, but I did everything wrong. But um, anyway, I know that God is sovereign. And um, even though we, we make mistakes in evangelism, that's not to keep God's elect from coming to faith. Um, thank you for that. Um, now, mm -hmm. just church history. Um, do you think uh, Constantine, did that have an effect on paganism entering, you know, the church? Yeah, Constantine, uh, in the fourth century, he was the Roman emperor, and he looked out over a fragmented Roman empire, and he said, you know, he had a vision, and he felt like Christianity could be the glue that would reunite the Roman empire. And so Constantine um, made it, an incentive to become a Christian. If you wanted to get ahead on the Roman Empire, you had to become a Christian. And so there was no need for repentance and faith. Just come and be baptized, and then you were part of Constantine's church. A lot of people point to that as the genesis of the Roman Catholic religion, because what happened, since there was no repentance, the pagans brought all their pagan traditions and practices into the Catholic Church, into the church at that time, which evolved into the Catholic Church. So... Yeah, you can mark Constantine as really the genesis of the Catholic Church. Mike, thank you for lending us your time mm -hmm. um, and answering these questions. Very helpful. Praise the Lord.
Would you be able to close us in a word of oh, prayer, sure. and then I'll give direction on uh, what is next? Yes. Oh, Father, what a joy it is to call you Father, to be adopted into your eternal family. No longer are you our judge, but you are a loving Father. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you didn't leave us in our sin, but you provided a Savior. And Father, we know salvation is all of you. We thank you for granting us repentance and giving us the gift of faith. Thank you for our new life in Christ. Thank you for the great privilege to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that as ambassadors, we can plead with the lost to be reconciled to God, knowing that their sins have separated them from you. We pray, Father, that today has been an opportunity for us to be equipped and encouraged. We pray, Father, for even opportunities this weekend that we might engage people that don't know the Savior. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that brings conviction and illumination as we share the gospel. Father, we look forward to what you will accomplish. Thank you for this church and its courage to seek the approval of God over the approval of men. We pray you'd bless this church and protect it from the fiery darts of the evil one. We look forward to the Lord's day where we can come together as the body of Christ to worship our exalted head. So until then, we thank you for uh, the love of our fellowship today. Thank you for your word that's encouraged us. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike.